The White People by Arthur Mackin Read by Charles Blakemore Part 2 The Green Book The Morocco binding of the book was faded, and the color had grown faint, but there were no stains or nor bruises nor marks of usage. The book looked as if it had been bought on a visit to London some seventy or eighty years ago and had somehow been forgotten and suffered to lie away out of sight. There was an old, delicate, lingering odor about it, such an odor as sometimes haunts an ancient piece of furniture for a century or more. The end papers, inside the binding, were oddly decorated with colored patterns and faded gold. It looked small, but the paper was fine, and there were many leaves closely covered with minute, painfully formed characters. I found this book, the manuscript began, in a drawer in the old bureau that stands on the landing. It was a very rainy day, and I could not go out, so in the afternoon I got a candle and rummaged in the bureau. Nearly all the drawers were full of old dresses, but one of the small ones looked empty, and I found this book hidden right at the back. I wanted a book like this, so I took it to write in. It is full of secrets. I have a great many other books of secrets I have written, hidden in a safe place, and I am going to write here many of the old secrets and some new ones, but there are some I shall not put down at all. I must not write down the real names of the days and months which I found out a year ago, nor the way to make the Aklo letters, or the Chayan language, or the great beautiful circles, nor the Mao games, nor the chief songs. I may write something about all these things, but not the way to do them, for peculiar reasons. And I must not say who the nymphs are, or the doles, or gelo, or what vulas mean. All these are most secret secrets, and I am glad when I remember what they are, and how many wonderful languages I know. But there are some things that I call the secrets of the secrets of the secrets, that I dare not think of unless I am quite alone, and then I shut my eyes, and put my hands over them, and whisper the word, and the Alala comes. I only do this at night in my room, or in certain woods that I know, but I must not describe them, as they are secret woods. Then there are the ceremonies, which are all of them important, but some are more delightful than others. There are the white ceremonies, and the green ceremonies, and the scarlet ceremonies. The scarlet ceremonies are the best. But there is only one place where they can be performed properly, though there is a very nice imitation, which I have done in other places. Besides these, I have the dances, and the comedy, and I have done the comedy sometimes when the others were looking and they didn't understand anything about it. I was very little when I first knew about these things. When I was very small and mother was alive, I can remember remembering things before that, only it has all got confused. But I remember when I was five or six, I heard them talking about me when they thought I was not noticing. They were saying how queer I was a year or two before, and how nurse had called my mother to come and listen to me talking all to myself, and I was saying words that nobody could understand. I was speaking the zoo language, but I only remember a very few of the words, as it was about the little white faces that used to look at me when I was lying in my cradle. They used to talk to me, and I learnt their language, and talked to them in it, about some great white place where they lived, where the trees and the grass were all white, and there were white hills as high up as the moon, and a cold wind. I have often dreamed of it afterwards, but the faces went away when I was very little. But a wonderful thing happened when I was about five. 
My nurse was carrying me on her shoulder. There was a field of yellow corn, and we went through it. It was very hot. Then we came to a path through a wood, and a tall man came after us, and went with us, till we came to a place where there was a deep pool, and it was very dark and shady. Nurse put me down on the soft moss under a tree, and she said, She can't get to the ponds now. So they left me there, and I sat quite still, and watched, and out of the water, and out of the wood, came two wonderful white people, and they began to play, and dance, and sing. They were a kind of creamy white, like the old ivory figure in the drawing-room. One was a beautiful lady, with kind dark eyes, and a grave face, and long black hair, and she smiled such a strange sad smile at the other, who laughed and came to her. They played together, and danced round and round the pool, and they sang a song till I fell asleep. Nurse woke me up when she came back, and she was looking something like the lady had looked, so I told her all about it, and asked her why she looked like that. At first she cried, and then she looked very frightened and turned quite pale. She put me down on the grass and stared at me, and I could see she was shaking all over. Then she said that I had been dreaming, but I knew I hadn't. Then she made me promise not to say a word about it to anybody, and if I did I should be thrown into the black pit. I was not frightened at all, though Nurse was, and I never forgot about it, because when I shut my eyes and it was quite quiet and I was all alone, I could see them again, very faint and far away, but very splendid and little bits of the song they sang came into my head, but I couldn't sing it. I was thirteen, nearly fourteen, when I had a very singular adventure, so strange that the day on which it happened is always called the White Day. My mother had been dead for more than a year, and in the morning I had lessons, but they let me go out for walks in the afternoon. And this afternoon I walked a new way, and a little brook led me into a new country, but I tore my frock getting through some of the difficult places, as the way was through many bushes, and beneath the low branches of trees, and up thorny thickets on the hills, and by dark woods full of creeping thorns. And it was a long, long way. It seemed as if I was going on for ever and ever and I had to creep by a place like a tunnel, where a brook must have been, but all the water had dried up, and the floor was rocky, and the bushes had grown overhead until they met, so that it was quite dark. And I went on and on through that dark place. It was a long, long way. And I came to a hill that I never saw before. I was in a dismal thicket, full of black twisted boughs, that tore me as I went through them, and I cried out because I was smarting all over, and then I found that I was climbing, and I went up and up a long way, till at last the thicket stopped, and I came out crying just under the top of a big bare place, where there were ugly grey stones lying all about on the grass and here and there a little twisted, stunted tree came out from under a stone, like a snake. And I went up, right to the top, a long way. I never saw such big, ugly stones before. They came out of the earth, some of them, and some looked as if they had been rolled to where they were, and they went on and on as far as I could see, a long, long way. I looked out from them and saw the country, but it was strange. It was winter time, and there were black, terrible woods hanging from the hills all round. It was like seeing a large room hung with black curtains, and the shape of the trees seemed quite different from any I had ever seen before. I was afraid. Then beyond the woods there were other hills, round in a great ring, but I had never seen any of them. 
It all looked black, and everything had a voor over it. It was all so still and silent, and the sky was heavy and gray and sad, like a wicked voorish dome in deep dendo. I went on into the dreadful rocks. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. Some were like horrid grinning men. I could see their faces as if they would jump at me out of the stone and catch hold of me and drag me with them back into the rock so that I should always be there. And there were other rocks that were like animals, creeping horrible animals, putting out their tongues, and others that were like words that I could not say, and others like dead people lying on the grass. I went on among them, though they frightened me, and my heart was full of wicked songs that they put into it. And I wanted to make faces and twist myself about in the way they did, and I went on and on a long way till at last I liked the rocks, and they didn't frighten me any more. I sang the songs I thought of, songs full of words that must not be spoken or written down. Then I made faces like the faces on the rocks, and I twisted myself about like the twisted ones, and I lay down flat on the ground like the dead ones, and I went up to one that was grinning and put my arms round him and hugged. And so I went on and on through the rocks till I came to a round mound in the middle of them. It was higher than a mound, it was nearly as high as our house, and it was like a green basin turned upside down, all smooth and round and green, with one stone like a post sticking up at the top. I climbed up the sides, but they were so steep that I had to stop or I should have rolled all the way down again. And I should have knocked against the stones at the bottom and perhaps been killed. But I wanted to get up to the very top of the big round mound. So I lay down flat on my face and took hold of the grass with my hands and drew myself up bit by bit till I was at the top. Then I sat down on the stone in the middle and looked all round about. I felt I had come such a long, long way, just as if I were a hundred miles from home or in some other country. Or in one of the strange places I had read about in the tales of the genie and the Arabian Nights, or as if I had gone across the sea far away for years, and I had found another world that nobody had ever seen or heard of before, or as if I had somehow flown through the sky and fallen on one of the stars I had read about, where everything is dead and cold and gray, and there is no air, and the wind doesn't blow. I sat on the stone and looked all round and down and round about me. It was just as if I was sitting on a tower in the middle of a great empty town, because I could see nothing all around but the gray rocks on the ground. I couldn't make out their shapes any more, but I could see them on and on for a long way, and I looked at them, and they seemed as if they had been arranged into patterns and shapes and figures. I knew they couldn't be, because I had seen a lot of them coming right out of the earth, joined to the deep rocks below, so I looked again, but still I saw nothing but circles, and small circles inside big ones, and pyramids, and domes, and spires, and they seemed all to go round and round the place where I was sitting, and the more I looked, the more I saw great big rings of rocks, getting bigger and bigger, and I stared so long that it felt as if they were all moving and turning like a great wheel, and I was turning, too, in the middle. I got quite dizzy and queer in the head, and everything began to be hazy and not clear, and I saw little sparks of blue light and the stones looked as if they were springing and dancing and twisting as they went round and round and round. I was frightened again, and I cried out loud, and jumped up from the stone I was sitting on, and fell down. When I got up, I was so glad they all looked still, and I sat down on top, and slid down the mound, and went on again. 
I danced as I went, in the peculiar way the rocks had danced when I got giddy. And I was so glad I could do it quite well. And I danced and danced along, and sang extraordinary songs that came into my head. At last I came to the edge of that great flat hill, and there were no more rocks, and the way went again through a dark thicket in a hollow. It was just as bad as the other one I went through, climbing up, but I didn't mind this one, because I was so glad I had seen those singular dances and could imitate them. I went down, creeping through the bushes, and a tall nettle stung me on my leg and made me burn, but I didn't mind it, and I tingled with the boughs and the thorns, but I only laughed and sang. Then I got out of the thicket into a close valley, a little secret place, like a dark passage that nobody ever knows of, because it was so narrow and deep and the woods were so thick round it. There is a steep bank with trees hanging over it, and there the ferns keep green all through the winter, when they are dead and brown on the hill. And the ferns there have a sweet, rich smell, like what oozes out of fir trees. There was a little stream of water running down this valley, so small that I could easily step across it. I drank the water with my hand, and it tasted like bright yellow wine, and it sparkled and bubbled as it ran down over beautiful red and yellow and green stones, so that it seemed alive and all colors at once. I drank it, and I drank more with my hand, but I couldn't drink enough, so I lay down and bent my head and sucked the water up with my lips. It tasted much better drinking that way and a ripple would come up to my mouth and give me a kiss, and I laughed and drank again, and pretended there was a nymph, like the one in the old picture at home, who lived in the water and was kissing me. So I bent low down to the water, and put my lips softly to it, and whispered to the nymph that I would come again. I felt sure it could not be common water. I was so glad when I got up and went on and I danced again, and went up and up the valley under hanging hills. And when, when I came to the top, the ground rose up in front of me, tall and steep as a wall, and there was nothing but the green wall and the sky. I thought of forever and forever, world without end, amen. And I thought I must have really found the end of the world, because it was like the end of everything, as if there could be nothing at all beyond, except the kingdom of Vur, where the light goes when it is put out, and the water goes when the sun takes it away. I began to think of all the long, long way I had journeyed, how I had found a brook and followed it, and followed it on, and gone through bushes and thorny thickets, and dark woods full of creeping thorns. Then I had crept up a tunnel under trees, and climbed a thicket, and seen all the grey rocks, and sat in the middle of them when they turned round, and then I had gone on through the grey rocks, and come down the hill through the stinging thicket, and up the dark valley, all a long, long way. I wondered how I should get home again, if I could ever find the way, and if my home was there any more or if it were turned and everybody in it into grey rocks, as in the Arabian Nights. So I sat down on the grass and thought what I should do next. I was tired, and my feet were hot with walking, and as I looked about I saw there was a wonderful well just under the high steep wall of grass. All the ground round it was covered with bright green dripping moss. There was every kind of moss there, moss like beautiful little ferns, and like palms and fir trees, and it was all green as jewelry, and drops of water hung on it like diamonds. And in the middle was the great well, deep and shining and beautiful, so clear that it looked as if I could touch the red sand at the bottom, but it was far below. I stood by it and looked in as if I were looking in a glass. At the bottom of the well, 
in the middle of it, the red grains of sand were moving and stirring all the time, and I saw how the water bubbled up, but at the top it was quite smooth and full and brimming. It was a great well, large like a bath, and with the shining, glittering green moss about it, it looked like a great white jewel with green jewels all around. My feet were so hot and tired that I took off my boots and stockings and let my feet down into the water, and the water was soft and cold, and when I got up I wasn't tired any more, and I felt I must go on farther and farther and see what was on the other side of the wall. I climbed up it very slowly, going sideways all the time, and when I got to the top and looked over, I was in the queerest country I had seen, stranger even than the hill of the grey rocks. It looked as if earth children had been playing there with their spades, as it was all hills and hollows and castles and walls made of earth and covered with grass. There were two mounds like big beehives, round and great and solemn, and then hollow basins, and then a steep mounting wall like the ones I saw once by the seaside where the big guns and the soldiers were. I nearly fell into one of the round hollows, it went away from under my feet so suddenly, and I ran fast down the side and stood at the bottom and looked up. It was strange and solemn to look up. There was nothing but the grey heavy sky and the sides of the hollow. Everything else had gone away, and the hollow was the whole world, and I thought that at night it must be full of ghosts and moving shadows, and pale things, where the moon shone down to the bottom at the dead of night, and the wind wailed up above. It was so strange and solemn and lonely, like a hollow temple of dead heathen gods. It reminded me of a tale my nurse had told me when I was quite little. It was the same nurse that took me into the wood where I saw the beautiful white people. And I remembered how nurse had told me the story one winter night when the wind was beating the trees against the wall and crying and moaning in the nursery chimney. She said there was, somewhere or other, a hollow pit, just like the one I was standing in. Everybody was afraid to go into it or near it. It was such a bad place. But once upon a time there was a poor girl who said she would go into the hollow pit, and everybody tried to stop her, but she would go. And she went down into the pit, and came back laughing, and said there was nothing there at all, except green grass and red stones and white stones and yellow flowers. And soon after people saw she had most beautiful emerald earrings, and they asked how she got them, as she and her mother were quite poor. But she laughed, and said her earrings were not made of emeralds at all, but only of green grass. Then one day she wore on her breast the reddest ruby that anyone had ever seen, and it was as big as a hen's egg, and glowed and sparkled like a hot burning coal of fire. And they asked how she got it, as she and her mother were quite poor. But she laughed and said it was not a ruby at all, but only a red stone. And then one day she wore round her neck the loveliest necklace that anyone had ever seen, much finer than the Queen's finest, and it was made of great bright diamonds, hundreds of them, and they shone like all the stars on a night in June. So they asked her how she got it, as she and her mother were quite poor, but she laughed and said they were not diamonds at all, but only white stones. And one day she went to the court, and she wore on her head a crown of pure angel gold, so nurse said, and it shone like the sun, and it was much more beautiful than the crown the king was wearing himself, and in her ears she wore the emeralds, and the big ruby was the brooch on her breast, and the great diamond necklace was sparkling on her neck. And the king and queen thought she was some great princess from a long way off. 
and got down from their thrones and went to meet her. But somebody told the king and queen who she was and that she was quite poor. So the king asked why she wore a gold crown and how she got it, as she and her mother were so poor. And she laughed and said it wasn't a gold crown at all, but only some yellow flowers she had put in her hair. And the king thought it was very strange, and said that she should stay at the court, and they would see what would happen next. And she was so lovely that everybody said that her eyes were greener than the emeralds, that her lips were redder than the ruby, that her skin was whiter than the diamonds, and that her hair was brighter than the golden crown. So the king's son said he would marry her, and the king said he might. And the bishop married them, and there was a great supper, and afterwards the king's son went to his wife's room. But just when he had his hand on the door, he saw a tall black man with a dreadful face standing in front of the door, and a voice said, Venture not upon your life, this is mine own wedded wife. Then the king's son fell down on the ground in a fit. And they came and tried to get into the room, but they couldn't, and they hacked at the door with hatchets, but the wood had turned hard as iron, and at last everybody ran away. They were so frightened at the screaming and laughing and shrieking and crying that came out of the room. But next day they went in and found there was nothing in the room but thick black smoke because the black man had come and taken her away. And on the bed there were two knots of faded grass and a red stone and some white stones and some faded yellow flowers. I remembered this tale of nurses while I was standing at the bottom of the deep hollow. It was so strange and solitary there, and I felt afraid. I could not see any stones or flowers, but I was afraid of bringing them away without knowing, and I thought I would do a charm that came into my head to keep the black man away. So I stood right in the very middle of the hollow, and I made sure that I had none of those things on me, and then I walked round the place and touched my eyes and my lips and my hair in a peculiar manner, and whispered some queer words that nurse taught me to keep bad things away. Then I felt safe, and climbed up out of the hollow, and went on through all those mounds and hollows and walls, till I came to the end, which was high above all the rest, and I could see that all the different shapes of the earth were arranged in patterns, something like the grey rocks, only the pattern was different. It was getting late, and the air was indistinct, but it looked from where I was standing something like two great figures of people lying on the grass. And I went on, and at last I found a certain wood which is too secret to be described, and nobody knows of the passage into it, which I found out in a very curious manner by seeing some little animal run into the wood through it. So I went after the animal by a very narrow, dark way, under thorns and bushes, and it was almost dark when I came to a kind of open place in the middle. And there I saw the most wonderful sight I have ever seen, but it was only for a minute, as I ran away directly and crept out of the wood by the passage I had come by, and ran and ran as fast as ever I could, because I was afraid. What I had seen was so wonderful and so strange and beautiful. But I wanted to get home and think of it, and I did not know what might not happen if I stayed by the wood. I was hot all over, and trembling, and my heart was beating, and strange cries that I could not help came from me as I ran from the wood. I was glad that a great white moon came up from over a round hill and showed me the way. So I went back through the hollows and mounds and down the close valley, and up through the thicket over the place of the grey rocks, and so at last I got home again. My father was busy in his study, and the servants had not told about my not coming home, though they were frightened, and wondered what they ought to do, so I told them I had lost my way, but I did not let them find out the real way I had been. I went to bed and lay awake all through the night, thinking of what I had seen. 
When I came out of the narrow way, and it looked all shining, though the air was dark, it seemed so certain, and all the way home I was quite sure that I had seen it, and I wanted to be alone in my room and be glad over it all to myself, and shut my eyes, and pretend it was there, and do all the things I would have done if I had not been so afraid. But when I shut my eyes, the sight would not come, and I began to think about my adventures all over again, and I remembered how dusky and queer it was at the end, and I was afraid it must be all a mistake, because it seemed impossible it could happen. It seemed like one of Nurse's tales, which I didn't really believe in, though I was frightened at the bottom of the hollow. And the stories she told me when I was little came back into my head. and I wondered whether it was really there what I thought I had seen, or whether any of her tales could have happened a long time ago. It was so queer. I lay awake there in my room at the back of the house, and the moon was shining on the other side towards the river, so the bright light did not fall upon the wall, and the house was quite still. I had heard my father come upstairs, and just after the clock struck twelve, and after the house was still and empty, as if there was nobody alive in it. And though it was all dark and indistinct in my room, a pale, glimmering kind of light shone in through the white blind, and once I got up and looked out, and there was a great black shadow of the house covering the garden, looking like a prison where men are hanged. And then beyond it was all white, and the wood shone white with black gulfs between the trees. It was still and clear, and there were no clouds in the sky. I wanted to think of what I had seen, but I couldn't, and I began to think of all the tales that Nurse had told me so long ago that I thought I had forgotten, but they all came back. And mixed up with the thickets, and the gray rocks, and the hollows in the earth, and the secret wood, till I hardly knew what was new and what was old, or whether it was not all dreaming. And then I remembered that hot summer afternoon so long ago, when Nurse left me by myself in the shade, and the white people came out of the water, and out of the wood, and played, and danced, and sang, and I began to fancy that Nurse told me about something like it before I saw them, only I couldn't recollect exactly what she told me. Then I wondered whether she had been the white lady, as I remembered she was just as white and beautiful, and had the same dark eyes and black hair. And sometimes she smiled and looked like the lady had looked, when she was telling me some of her stories, beginning with Once on a Time or In the Time of the Fairies. But I thought she couldn't be the lady, as she seemed to have gone a different way into the wood, and I didn't think the man who came after us could be the other, or I couldn't have seen that wonderful secret in the secret wood. I thought of the moon. But it was afterwards when I was in the middle of the wild land, where the earth was made into the shape of great figures and it was all walls and mysterious hollows and smooth round mounds, that I saw the great white moon come up over a round hill. I was wondering about all these things, till at last I got quite frightened because I was afraid something had happened to me. And I remembered Nurse's tale of the poor girl who went into the hollow pit and was carried away at last by the black man. I knew I had gone into a hollow pit too, and perhaps it was the same, and I had done something dreadful. So I did the charm over again, and touched my eyes and my lips and my hair in a peculiar manner, and said the old words from the fairy language, so that I might be sure I had not been carried away. I tried again to see the secret wood, and to creep up the passage, and see what I had seen there, but somehow I couldn't. And I kept on thinking of Nurse's stories. There was one I remembered about a young man who once upon a time went hunting, and all the day he and his hounds hunted everywhere, and they crossed the rivers, and went into all the woods, and went round the marshes, but they couldn't find anything at all. And they hunted all day till the sun sank down and began to set behind the mountain. 
and the young man was angry because he couldn't find anything, and he was going to turn back when just as the sun touched the mountain, he saw come out of a break in front of him a beautiful white stag. And he cheered to his hounds, but they whined and would not follow, and he cheered to his horse, but it shivered and stood stock still, and the young man jumped off the horse and left the hounds and began to follow the white stag all alone. And soon it was quite dark, and the sky was black without a single star shining in it, and the stag went away into the darkness. And though the man had brought his gun with him, he never shot at the stag because he wanted to catch it, and he was afraid he would lose it in the night. But he never lost it once though the sky was so black and the air was so dark. And the stag went on and on till the young man didn't know a bit of where he was. And they went through enormous woods where the air was full of whispers and a pale dead light came out of the rotten trunks that were lying on the ground. And just as the man thought he had lost the stag, he would see it, all white and shining in front of him, and he would run fast to catch it, but the stag always ran faster, so he did not catch it. And they went through the enormous woods, and they swam across rivers, and they waded through black marshes where the ground bubbled, and the air was full of will-o'-the-wisps, and the stag fled away down into rocky, narrow valleys, where the air was like the smell of a vault, and the man went after it. They went over the great mountains, and the man heard the wind come down from the sky, and the stag went on, and the man went after. At last the sun rose, and the young man found he was in a country he had never seen before. It was a beautiful valley, with a bright stream running through it, and a great big round hill in the middle. And the stag went down the valley towards the hill, and it seemed to be getting tired, and went slower and slower, and though the man was tired too, he began to run faster, and he was sure he could catch the stag at last. But just as they got to the bottom of the hill, and the man stretched out his hand to catch the stag, it vanished into the earth, and the man began to cry. He was so sorry that he had lost it after all his long hunting. But as he was crying, he saw there was a door in the hill just in front of him, and he went in, and it was quite dark, but he went on, as he thought he would find the white stag and all of a sudden it got light, and there was the sky, and the sun shining, and the birds singing in the trees, and there was a beautiful fountain. And by the fountain a lovely lady was sitting, who was the queen of the fairies, and she told the man she had changed herself into a stag to bring him there, because she loved him so much. Then she brought out a great gold cup covered with jewels from her fairy palace, and she offered him wine in the cup to drink. And he drank. And the more he drank, the more he longed to drink, because the wine was enchanted. So he kissed the lovely lady, and she became his wife. And he stayed all that day and all that night in the hill where she lived. And when he woke, he found he was lying on the ground, close to where he had seen the stag first, and his horse was there, and his hounds were there waiting. And he looked up, and the sun sank behind the mountain. And he went home and lived a long time, but he would never kiss any other lady, because he had kissed the queen of the fairies, and he would never drink common wine any more, because he had drunk enchanted wine. And sometimes a nurse told me tales that she had heard from her great-grandmother, who was very old, and lived in a cottage on the mountain all alone and most of these tales were about a hill where people used to meet at night long ago, and they used to play all sorts of strange games, and do queer things that Nurse told me of, but I couldn't understand. And now, she said, everybody but her great-grandmother had forgotten all about it, and nobody knew where the hill was, not even her great-grandmother. But she told me one very strange story about the hill, and I trembled when I remembered it. She said that people always went there in summer when it was very hot, and they had to dance a good deal. 
It would be all dark at first, and there were trees there which made it much darker, and people would come one by one from all directions by a secret path which nobody else knew. And two persons would keep the gate, and every one as they came up had to give a very curious sign which nurse showed me as well as she could, but she said she couldn't show me properly. And all kinds of people would come. There would be gentlefolks and village folks, and some old people and boys and girls and quite small children who sat and watched. And it would all be dark as they came in, except in one corner. Where someone was burning something that smelt strong and sweet and made them laugh. And there one would see a glaring of coals and the smoke mounting up red. So they would all come in, and when the last had come, there was no door any more, so that no one else could get in, even if they knew there was anything beyond. And once a gentleman who was a stranger, And had ridden a long way, lost his path at night, and his horse took him into the very middle of the wild country, where everything was upside down, and there were dreadful marshes, and great stones everywhere, and holes underfoot, and the trees looked like gibbet posts, because they had great black arms that stretched out across the way. And this strange gentleman was very frightened, and his horse began to shiver all over. And at last it stopped and wouldn't go any farther. And the gentleman got down and tried to lead the horse, but it wouldn't move. And it was all covered with sweat, like death. So the gentleman went on all alone, going farther and farther into the wild country, till at last he came to a dark place where he heard shouting and singing and crying like nothing he had ever heard before. It all sounded quite close to him, but he couldn't get in. And so he began to call, and while he was calling, something came behind him, and in a minute his mouth and arms and legs were all bound up, and he fell into a swoon. And when he came to himself, he was lying by the roadside, just where he had first lost his way, under a blasted oak with a black trunk, and his horse was tied beside him. So he rode on to the town and told the people. What had happened, and some of them were amazed, but others knew. So when once everybody had come, there was no door at all for anybody else to pass in by. And when they were all inside, round in a ring, touching each other, some one began to sing in the darkness, and some one else would make a noise like thunder with a thing they had on purpose. And on still nights, people would hear the thundering noise far, far away beyond the wild land, and some of them, who thought they knew what it was, used to make a sign on their breasts when they woke up in their beds at dead of night and heard that terrible deep noise like thunder on the mountains. And the noise and the singing would go on and on for a long time, and the people who were in a ring swayed a little to and fro. And the song was in an old, old language that nobody knows now, and the tune was queer. Nurse said her great grandmother had known someone who remembered a little of it when she was quite a little girl, and Nurse tried to sing some of it to me, and it was so strange a tune that I turned all cold and my flesh crept as if I had put my hand on something dead. Sometimes it was a man that sang, and sometimes it was a woman, and sometimes the one who sang it did it so well that two or three people who were there fell to the ground shrieking and tearing with their hands. The singing went on, and the people in the ring kept swaying to and fro for a long time, and at last the moon would rise over a place they called the Toll Dale and came up. And showed them swinging and swaying from side to side, with the sweet thick smoke curling up from the burning coals and floating in circles all round them. Then they had their supper. A boy and a girl brought it to them. The boy carried a great cup of wine, and the girl carried a cake of bread, and they passed the bread and the wine round and round, but they tasted quite different from common bread and common wine. And changed everybody that tasted them. 
Then they all rose up and danced, and secret things were brought out from some hiding place, and they played extraordinary games, and danced round and round and round in the moonlight, and sometimes people would suddenly disappear and never be heard of afterwards, and nobody knew what had happened to them. And they drank more of that curious wine, and they made images and worshipped them. And Nurse showed me how the images were made one day when we were out for a walk and we passed by a place where there was a lot of wet clay. So Nurse asked me if I would like to know what those things were like that they made on the hill, and I said yes. Then she asked me if I would promise never to tell a living soul a word about it, and if I did I was to be thrown into the black pit with the dead people, and I said I wouldn't tell anybody. And she said the same thing again and again, and I promised. So she took my wooden spade and dug a big lump of clay and put it in my tin bucket and told me to say if anyone met us that I was going to make pies when I went home. Then we went on a little way until we came to a little break growing right down into the road, and Nurse stopped and looked up the road and down it and peeped through the hedge into the field on the other side, and then she said, Quick! And we ran into the brake, and crept in and out among the bushes until we had gone a good way from the road. Then we sat down under a bush, and I wanted so much to know what Nurse was going to make with the clay. But before she would begin, she made me promise again not to say a word about it and she went again and peeped through the bushes on every side, though the lane was so small and deep that hardly anybody ever went there. So we sat down, and Nurse took the clay out of the bucket and began to knead it with her hands and do queer things with it and turn it about. And she hid it under a big dock leaf for a minute or two, and then she brought it out again. And then she stood up, and sat down and walked round the clay in a peculiar manner, and all the time she was softly singing a sort of rhyme, and her face got very red. Then she sat down again and took the clay in her hands and began to shape it into a doll, but not like the dolls I have at home. And she made the queerest doll I had ever seen, all out of the wet clay, and hid it under a bush to get dry and hard, and all the time she was making it she was singing these rhymes to herself, and her face got redder and redder. So we left the doll there, hidden away in the bushes where nobody would ever find it. And a few days later we went the same walk, and when we came to that narrow dark part of the lane where the brake runs down to the bank, Nurse made me promise all over again, and she looked about, just as she had done before, and we crept into the bushes till we got to the green place where the little clay man was hidden. I remember it all so well, though I was only eight, and it is eight years ago now as I am writing it down, but the sky was a deep violet blue, and in the middle of the break where we were sitting there was a great elder tree covered with blossoms, and on the other side there was a clump of meadow sweet. And when I think of that day, the smell of the meadow sweet and elder blossom seems to fill the room, and if I shut my eyes, I can see the glaring blue sky with little clouds very white floating across it, and Nurse, who went away long ago, sitting opposite me and looking like the beautiful white lady in the wood. So we sat down, and Nurse took out the clay doll from the secret place where she had hidden it and she said we must pay our respects. And she would show me what to do, and I must watch her all the time. So she did all sorts of queer things with the little clay man, and I noticed she was all streaming with perspiration, though we had walked so slowly. And then she told me to pay my respects, and I did everything she did because I liked her. And it was such an odd game and she said that if one loved very much, the clay man was very good, if one did certain things with it, and if one hated very much, it was just as good, 
only one how to do different things. And we played with it a long time and pretended all sorts of things. Nurse said her great-grandmother had told her all about these images, but what we did was no harm at all, only a game. But she told me a story about these images that frightened me very much, and that was what I remembered that night as I was lying awake in my room in the pale, empty darkness, thinking of what I had seen and the secret wood.